Hey, welcome guys. I'm Pastor Rex, Senior Pastor at Pursuit Church. I want to thank you for joining us for this week's teachings from our Sunday worship service. If you would like more information, you can find us online at PursuitNazarene.org. My prayer is that God will grow your faith through the hearing of His Word. So let's listen in. Here we go. Well, I hope that your summer is finding you well and um, that you're enjoying your time with your family. I know that Pastor Rex is, is out right now enjoying time with his family and uh, what a blessing it is to be able to just kind of give him that opportunity to spend time away. You know, pastors are kind of amazing creatures and uh, these guys work all the time, day in and day out, and um, it's just, they're, never, they're always on call. So when you think of Pastor Rex, please pray for him and just encourage him. Uh, we have a really good pastor, and I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for Pastor Rex, and I'm happy to be able to fill in for him a little bit today. Um, well, you know, with a, with a title like, When Life Brings Us a God-Sized Enemy, you might be coming thinking, you know, all right, here's another one of those David and Goliath things, and we're going to learn three easy steps to overcome the Goliaths in our lives and, and that kind of thing, right? You hear 10 easy ways to defeat some you know, monster that you're facing in your life, and I'm just going to tell you, this is not going to be one of those services. So it's not going to be one of those messages. Um, because... I think that oftentimes what happens in our lives is that we face enemies of a size and a threat that we're just not big enough for. And the hero of the story will never be us. And when it is, uh, we, have, we have thought it through wrong. Um, the hero of the story is the God of the universe. Amen? And, and that's what we need to know, who we need to know, and why we're here. Um, so... You know, instead of, instead of figuring out how we can become more powerful, uh, I think oftentimes, you know, it's, it's easy to preach on things of that nature instead of just being reminded about this amazing God that we serve that does amazing things. And He sets up these scenarios in our lives that are impossible sometimes. And I always hear people go, God will never give you more than you can bear. And I'm thinking, how long have you been alive? You know, I, I don't know. I've faced plenty of things that I go, whoa, I am not equipped for that. I, this is way bigger than me. And, and I know people, you know, some of you, I know you've gone through and are going through things that are bigger than you can face today, that are, that are bigger than, than you're going to find strength for in your, own, in your own self. And to me, I look and go, perfect. God's got us right where He wants us. God's got us right where He needs us to be. Because in me, I keep trying to figure out, ah, if it's just as much as I can handle in my life, if I only take on the things, the challenges that are just big enough for me, whew, my life isn't big enough. And if your life is only big enough for the challenges that you can handle, your life's not big enough. You need a bigger life. You need a life that's big enough, that's so big and so out of your control that only when God fits in, something that uh, God-sized enemies, when God-sized challenges are in front of us, when we, need, we got something so big that, that there's room enough for the God who created the universe to come into our lives and to show us how awesome He is. Amen? That's what we're looking for. So let me give you a little backstory before we jump into our text this morning. Um, and the backstory is really found in the first 14 chapters, 13 chapters of the book of Samuel. Um, and really, the majority of it's in chapter 13. Um, I'll give you the nutshell version. Um, Saul was the first king of the nation of Israel. Uh, the Israelis wanted a king. They didn't want to be ruled by judges. So Saul says, so God says, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. And they give them this very handsome, charismatic man, Saul, who is very self-confident. He's very, he's very impressed with his own abilities. He's good at war. He's, he's strategically 
pretty solid. He's not a bad, bad ruler, but he's not a ruler after the Lord's own heart. And along the way, when you look at the life of Saul, you really see that. <clears throat> and what's happened at this point in time in, in his life is that Saul has gone and picked a fight with the Philistines. And the Philistines and the, and the Israelites have been, have been kind of at war with each other for a number of centuries now. And so the Philistines have been clever. The Philistines have done a few things um, like they have assassinated all of the blacksmiths in Israel. Um, and so they've made it to where if there's any iron work being done, the Israelites have to come and get that done by the Philistines. <clears throat> Unfortunately, now they have no weapons because of this. Um, and so they've got, and they've got just farm implements. And they have to take the farm implements to the Philistines to get them sharpened because they're about ready to go to war with who? The Philistines. So it's not the most strategically savvy plan for the Israelites, but it was super smart by the Philistines. And they're getting ready to pick a fight with the Philistines. <clears throat> Sam, uh, Saul and his son Jonathan go out to war. And Saul has about 3,000 troops with him. And Jonathan has about 2,000 troops with him. And they're getting ready to go to battle. And up show the Philistines. 30,000 uh, 30, men with chariots, 6,000 men on horseback. And it says, and it says with, with um, it says, foot soldiers like the sand of the seashore in multitude. So you have 5,000 people getting ready to do battle with a, with a, a force of absolutely epic proportions. And here you go, and they did exactly what I think I would tend to do. Maybe you might tend to do. Just go, hey, maybe there's a cave we can go hide in. <laughs> maybe there's somewhere we can get out of the way and they won't see us. <laughs> and, and, and maybe we can rethink this strategy. And, and uh, Saul and Jonathan, they, kind of set, they're, they got in separate groups, but they're still they're hiding in the hills. And they're, they're, they're really going, oh no, what are we going to do now? Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's in this hiding that, uh, that the story picks up in chapter 14, verse 1. And we're going to read the first eight verses here together. And I'm reading out of an uh, English Standard Version, but I've got the... NIV up on the board if you're interested. It won't read exactly the same, but it's close enough. And uh, so if you see any discrepancies, don't freak out. It's okay. Um, so one day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carries his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah, in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahiatab, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. <clears throat> and the people didn't know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Senech. The one crag rose to the north in front of Michmash, and the other to the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of, the uns of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord by saving, from saving by many or by a few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. So, <clears throat> Jonathan 
gets this great idea. Hey, let's go over, me and you. Don't worry about getting dressed. You can just wear your ephod, and, which is kind of like saying he was still in his PJs. And let's go over and pick a fight. Let's go over and pick a fight with these guys. And, and I, love, I love how there's, there's this moment where, where he says, he says you, you expect him to say something like, they can take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom, right? And, and you're thinking, come on, dude, this rousting speech that we can all go and, and we're going we're gonna to go over and we're going to take them and for freedom's sake... But it's not that. He says, he says, come, let's go over to this garrison of these uncircumcised. That the, and it may be that the Lord will work for us. <laughs> let's go take on 45,000 plus soldiers, me and you. Come on. Maybe the Lord will show up. I don't know. I'm just thinking... I would have gone, I would have started asking some questions. You know, I would, I would have started saying, um, explain this plan to me a little bit more. Did you hear from the Lord? Was this, did God tell you to go do this? You know, exactly why should we do that? And did you hear the path that they're going? Okay. Cliff on one side, cliff on the other side. We got to walk through the middle of them. They've got the high ground. We're going to go over and take on this massive army, me and you, come on. I'm the only, like me and my dad, we're the only guys with swords in the whole army. You're my armor bearer. Let's go take them on. Let's go pick a fight. I just think that uh, I would have expected this, you know, I've got this, we've got, the odds are really in our favor. (laughs) <laughs> 40,000 to 1. Yeah, those are good odds. Come on. Let's do it. You know? And I guess, uh, I guess, you know, I, I think how many of us really observe great, true, and right things that need to be done, battles that need to be fought, but we stand around and we wait for a calling from the Lord. <clears throat> There's all kinds of wars that need to be fought in our world, in our, in our culture, in our lives, in our community. We're going, yep, somebody ought to save these people. I meant you. You know, somebody needs to take that first step and do something. And we're just waiting, standing around waiting for somebody to take that first step. What I love about Jonathan is he's not waiting. He just, you know what? Somebody needs to shut these guys up. Come on. Let's go do it. Maybe the Lord will turn up. And if the Lord shows up, well, He can, he can, save, he can save Israel by, by a, a massive army, and He can save Israel by me and you. And uh, that's pretty impressive. I guess, I guess... I think to myself how many times I've been afraid to move forward without a really solid plan in place. You know, we really want some secure plan. You know, uh, what, what's the plan for how you're going to do it? I work for the Gospel Rescue Mission in Grants Pass, and, and um, I was there during the time when we built the men's facility, when we went from a small 2,000 square foot building to now we've got this big 28,000 square foot men's facility that we've been in for a while. And I was there when, when Pastor Heck had been praying about how will I know if it's time to go, if it's time for us to do this big project, because we were just this little tiny organization, how will I know when it's time to go take on a $3 million, $3.5 million facility? And, and as he was praying about it, a check for $40,000 came in the mail. Now, $40,000 in the face of $3.5 million is a drop in the bucket. Oh, bless you, my sister. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, but for him, 
It's the largest check we'd seen. Here we go. And I watched in a year's time. All of a sudden, man, checks just started pouring in. You realize, wow, that was all he needed. That was the nudge he needed. He was crazy enough that he just was like, yep, that must be the Lord, and I'm going to do it. Didn't seem like the skywriting sign that we would want. Didn't seem like the, the voice, you know, we want to hear, Ryan, go do this, you know, and, and everything. I want, to hear, I want to hear the burning bush, the voice out of the bush. I want to hear something clear and concise. Sometimes what it is is we, just, we see something that needs to be done, and you're there. That's your calling. Go do it. What's the worst that's going to happen? What's the worst that's going to happen? The worst that's going to happen is that you're going to die, right? Everybody here is going to die, right? I could die for... I could, we could die, you know, doing something dumb, man. Forgetting to turn on our blinker as we're turning out and getting hit. We could, we could die tripping over something on the way to the mailbox, getting, you know, just, just going there. Or we could die trying to just glorify God. And if I want to, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet my maker at some point in time, and so are you, we're going to step across that veil at some point in time, me and you both, all of us. How do you want to meet him? Wouldn't it be cool to be like, yeah, I, hey, <laughs> you're here. Wow, I, I, was just ready to, I was just ready to take on 40,000 Philistines. <laughs> I, was, I was ready to go out single-handedly and take on 40,000 Philistines. I got through about two of them. <laughs> and then there you are. <laughs> wow, here I am. <laughs> Didn't work out the way I intended. I thought maybe you'd show up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> pretty awesome. Jonathan's chances of survival were bleak. And yet, <clears throat> how many here know that our hope is never found in chances? Do you realize that? Your hope and mine are never found in the odds. They're never found in chances. Your hope and mine, if we have any, is in the God who rules the universe and holds it all together, whose, whose glory is worth dying for. That's where our hope is. Not in odds and chances. I got a, a 40,000 to 1 plus chance of survival. Odds against me. <laughs> chances of survival. Sounds good to me. Let's go. Grab a sword. You know, pretty cool. <laughs> Second Corinthians 1 9 reads like this. It says, This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He said, Indeed, we felt that we had received the death sentence. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Right? Paul was despairing of, of his life and, and worried about what would happen. Then he says, you know what? I'm never going to make it if I'm relying on me. I'm relying on God. And even if He takes my life, He can bring it back. He brought his own back. He can bring mine back, and I'm not afraid. That's pretty awesome. And uh, and how off, how awesome is it to hear to hear the, his armor bearer? His armor bearer is sitting there, you know, he, as Jonathan's sharing this plan with him. And uh, come, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us by many or by a few. And his armor bearer said, Do all that's in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Let me tell you, man. Don't we all need a friend like that? You know, I need people like that around me. And I need to be that kind of a person. That says, what? You're going to go serve the Lord? Oh, I'm in. I'm in. And yeah, it sounds crazy. It sounds like a crazy plan. Perfect. Let's go see what the Lord does. Maybe He'll show up. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we'll die. Maybe it'll be a miserable thing. Maybe it's going to be a complete flop and we'll go down in history as the dummies that went out and attacked the Philistines. Well, maybe the Lord will show up. 
could die for worse reasons, right? Maybe the Lord will show up. What a friend. What a partner. Somebody, somebody to be that way. Man, this guy was powerful. So Jonathan's not good at giving a speech. Um, and uh, John, Jonathan's not really concerned. He's not good with math, evidently. He's, he's not, good, he's not with, good with a lot of things, but he's good at picking an armor bearer. <laughs> and he's good at trusting the Lord. He's courageous, and he decides, you know what? Maybe the Lord will be in it. Maybe the Lord will show up. And if he does, oh, man, what a story that's going to be. What a story that's going to be. And man, what are they going to think about the God of Israel then? Because the Philistines had gods. But their gods, they were worshiping stuff that doesn't even exist. You know, we're talking about God. The one who created, who spoke, and the universe leapt into existence. If he shows up, oh, it's going to go bad for these guys. And they know it, and they're excited. And uh, so, let's continue reading. We'll pick up in verse 8. <clears throat> he says this, So Jonathan said, Behold, we'll cross over to the men, and we'll show ourselves. And here's the deal. If they say to us, Wait until we come over to you, well, we'll stand in our place, and we'll not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, <clears throat> then we'll go up, for the Lord has given, us, given them into our hand. And this shall be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they've hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into, into the hand of Israel. And then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and the armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. At the first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men with them as it were half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was panic in the camp and in the field and among all the people. And the garrison, even the raiders, trembled. And the earth quaked. And it became a very great panic. Whew. Man. God showed, showed up. You know, they, they, they're going, okay, here's how we're going to know. If they say you come here, then we know. All right. They're inviting us to the battle. And, and they, go, they go in. And in fact, it's so steep to get to the other side that they're climbing up on their hands and feet. Okay? Which, for me, I'd been like... <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Let me get my wind here. Okay, now I'm ready for battle. You know, maybe I get a milkshake real quick and then, I'll, then I'm good but these guys just they're excited they're pumped man they, they're, they're ready to go they get in and they just tear it up <clears throat> Jonathan understood that seizing an opportunity to make, to make large the glory of God was more important than staying alive and hiding he had his values right he had his values right. He, he wasn't, his, his greatest concern in his life wasn't preserving his life. Our lives, brothers and sisters, are here to give away. God blessed us with what we have to give away, including our lives. To, gi to give away to the world around us. To give away for God's glory. To make large God's glory in the world. And... This is, what, this is what our life is made for. And Jonathan understood that. And he said, he's just aching for the opportunity. He gets up in the middle of the night. Let's go do it. I got an idea. Let's go take those guys. Somebody needs to shut them up. Somebody needs to cut them down. Somebody needs to get this enemy out of our way. And I don't see anybody else stepping up to the task. So let's go, me and you. Come on. 
But his buddies, yeah, yeah, let's do it. I'll, I'll follow you wherever you go. Right on. That's the kind of person you want to go to battle with. And these guys understood this, and they went. The Apostle Paul, again, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 8, he writes this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own, <clears throat> which comes out of the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. <clears throat> That's exciting. The Apostle Paul understood that earlier in the chapter, in chapter 1, verse 21. He writes, he writes this, he says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So he's got an opportunity set in front of him to do something great for the glory of God. And he, and he does it. And he jumps out there and he does it. And Jonathan's courage didn't come from the knowledge of his enemy. He didn't sit there and go, you know what we need to do? We need to sit down and we need to study the Philistines. We need to study the Philistines and what makes them tick. Let's sit down and make a thought study of, of how, how, you know, let's think about all the, the things that they believe in and, and let's go in and, and try and get our heads around all those things. And I'm not saying that, that Jonathan didn't know those things possibly, but that wasn't what motivated him. What he knew about God was what motivated him. What he knew is this, that if God shows up, I don't care how big the enemy is, if God shows up, It'll be worth it. They will write songs about this. It will be worth it. They will, they will tell stories about this for the rest of eternity, about this moment, if God shows up. And that's worth a chance. That's worth, that's worth going out and living for. That's what's go, worth going out and dying for. So, Jonathan was excited. An enemy of such epic proportions drove Saul into solitude and hiding. <clears throat> but it bonded Jonathan and his armor bearer. Sometimes, sometimes troubles that come on us have different effects on us, right? I mean, you remember the story of Elijah after he just got done killing the prophets of Baal and then Jezebel says, may that happen to me if you're not dead by the end of the day. And Elijah runs and hides. <laughs> He goes out into the wilderness, a day's journey into the wilderness, and hides. <laughs> I don't know, you know. I'll hear a rousting sermon on a Sunday morning, and Monday comes, and sometimes Monday comes with stuff that's frightening, that's more than I'm ready to face. And my tendency is to go, oh, I just want to run and hide from it all. I just want to get away from it all. There's an interesting thing when you've got a good friend, when you have somebody that knows the Lord and that is committed to Him, and you, and you don't hide, but you come, you come together and you, you, you talk together. You encourage one another and you remind each other of the God you serve, about that the God's bigger than Monday, that God's bigger than than. Well, he's always bigger than my bank account, but uh, God's bigger than my bank account, right? He's bigger than my bills. Yay, there we go. He's bigger, than, he's bigger than my illness. He's bigger than the thing that's facing me, the troubles that are facing me. He's bigger than, than the, the life that, the, the bad things that I can think of that might come up in front of me that, that frighten me. The past that I've been running from that I just hope never shows itself up in my future. Those things that cause me anxiety and depression. He's bigger than all of that. And when I've got a friend that reminds me of those things, sometimes that person's a real armor bearer for me. They're the real, they really 
They really are that. And, and it makes me want to be that for my brothers and, and my sisters in Christ. It's, it's my friends that I know when they're going through a hard time. It makes me want to be the one that goes, hey, remember the Lord. Remember, you know this. You know this. I know you know it. And when, I, when I'm able to kind of give that encouragement, I know Robert and I have spent many time on a treadmill, <laughs> sweat. And sometimes sweat and tears coming down our faces, sitting there going through struggles and, and, and you know, worried about things in, in front of us. And we're going, ah, ah, you know this. You got this. You know the Lord's going to be with you, man. And we're sweating and we're breathing hard, but we're encouraging each other. And I love you for that, man. And I, love, and I love my friends. I've got other brothers just the same way. They go, you know what? You're going to be strong through this. You're going to be okay through this. God's going to meet. Maybe God will show up. And if He shows up, oh, this is going to be amazing. So my encouragement in part is to have brothers like that around you, brothers and sisters like that around you. But it's also to be that person. Be that person for somebody else because sometimes that's exactly what we need to be encouraged to step out and do great things for the Lord. So, <clears throat> Saul wasted his opportunity, but uh, Jonathan, he'd had enough. He just decided, I've had enough. I need to go pick a fight. I'm so sick and tired of hearing an enemy taunt and hearing an enemy brag about their size and brag about their power and brag about their prestige and, and their wisdom and how they tricked me and duped me along the way. Let's go take the fight to the enemy. Let's go on and, and see what happens. And, and I love Jonathan for that. And I love this story for that. The question is, is there an enemy you're facing? I know some of you are facing enemies. I know some of you really well. Some of you I don't know, and yet I know this, that if you're not facing an enemy, you will. If you're not facing one, it's going to come, you know. And maybe you've faced some already. But you know life, I mean, it's just up, it's up and down. It's never, it's never just a real stable, smooth ride, is it? I mean, it would be so nice if it were. But how would we know how awesome God is if it were? But we're just stable and nice and awesome. You know, it, it, would, it would just, we'd never know the fantastic things that the Lord can do. And we only know the fantastic things that the Lord can do if He brings up massive God sized challenges and massive God sized enemies in our lives. So, here's my thing. You know, I mean, maybe you've got a trauma in your past, you know, a decision that you're trying to avoid, something that you're, that you're running from. Maybe it's, maybe it's the thought of just faithfully moving forward. Maybe, maybe it's just thinking, I, I don't know if I can just... My biggest challenge is going to be putting one step in front of me tomorrow. You know, I've got to make it through the day today. Anybody ever feel like that? And I can tell you right now, I've felt like that. You know, I'm not... Plans in the distance... I got to get through lunch, you know. I got to get it through halfway through the day, you know. I got to decide just to make it through the hour sometimes, okay. <clears throat> Maybe it's a sin you feel trapped in. You're thinking, man, I'm never going to get out of this. I am never going to stop. It's just, you're, you're making peace with it. You're just saying, well, this is just who I am. This is just part of who I am. And I'm stuck with it. Don't waste your enemy, okay? This enemy, this challenge has been brought into your life on purpose. Don't waste it. Brothers and sisters, God brings these things not just for you and me, although they are for you and me, but it's not just for you and me. It's so that we can know Him in ways that, that would be impossible to know Him. It's so that we could see Him in glorious ways that we would never know. And God wants to be glorious in your life. John Piper always says that 
God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in Him. Man. So He takes us into these places that are treacherous and unnerving and unsettling and fearful. And He does it on purpose so that we can learn to find satisfaction in Him. And when we do, oh man, then when everything is going easy, whew, oh, thank you, Lord. But also, when the next thing that comes along, we go, well, you were faithful to bring me through that thing. And if you were faithful to bring me through that, that event, that trauma, that trial, then maybe, maybe 40 plus thousand Philistines isn't so bad. Maybe I can go in and take that on as well. I'm going to give you three ways to take advantage of and not waste the challenge or the enemy in front of you. Three ways, okay? And here you go. You will waste your enemy if you choose to isolate from others over it. Okay? You will waste the enemy in front of you and the challenge in front of you if you choose to isolate over it. You're wasting it. You're wasting the enemy. God has brought this thing into your life <clears throat> so that you can connect with others in community and be, you can minister to others and they can minister to you. Do you have an armor bearer in your life? Are you an armor bearer for somebody else? Somebody else that's going through some, some struggles right now? I know some of you need armor bearers right now. You need people around you that go, you know what? Hey, remember? God might show up. And if God shows up, this is going to be an amazing time. And I know it doesn't feel amazing. And I know the, the size of the enemy is overwhelming. And it's huge. But God might show up. And let's not rule him out of the, out of the, out of the equation. <clears throat> if you have a friend in battle, go to war with him right now. Don't let, don't let them isolate, and don't you isolate. Connect, okay? We're made for each other. We belong to one another. You know, when we do communion, one of the things that we are saying, and when we do baptism, all of the sacraments, they are made for a lot, to, to remind us of what Christ did on the cross for His body broken, for His death, burial, and resurre uh, resurrection, but they're also to remind us of this, that we belong to each other. We're family now, guys. And you don't get to pick your family, right? You don't get to pick your family. We belong to each other. We need each other. So we don't get to go, well, you know, Brian's kind of a jerk, man. I mean, he, didn't, he didn't say, the, I don't like the way he talks. And da, da, da. I'm going to go to a different church. You know, Rex has got that funny hair, man. Let me go to a church. Let's go to a church where there's a guy. I mean, he's funny, but man, did you see his hair? Let's go to a normal church, guy with a pastor with normal hair and stuff like that. He's going to get a kick out of that on the, on the podcast. <coughs> so they're all laughing, Rex. So <clears throat> we don't get to pick our family, guys. We're, we, we get who God brings into our lives. And our job is to be committed to one another and to, and to bond together and to look out for each other and to bleed together and be armor bearers for one another. Don't isolate. Get together. You'll waste your, you will waste your enemy if you choose to isolate from others over it. Here's another one. You will waste this enemy if you don't believe that God designed it for you. Okay? This enemy is not in front of you by accident. Okay? It's not by chances. It's not by odds. We live in a universe that is under a control of a sovereign God who created every single molecule in it, who holds the stars in their place and knows the hairs of your head, they're numbered, knows when one falls from it. He's been counting lots on my head as they abandon ship. Um, <coughs> you know, he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He knows when, when, a, when a, a lamb is born in the mountains. He knows everything that's going on and He's intentional in these things. And He's designed it for your good. And He's designed it for His glory. To show you something about Him that you could never know any other way. Sometimes we just go, I don't want to know it that way. If there was a better way to do it, He'd, he'd have done it. 
He's the smartest being in the universe. (laughs) If there was a better way to do it, if there was a more right, kind, loving, generous, good, faithful way to do it, He would have done it. Which is exactly why He's done it the way it is. This is why the enemy is in front of you. This is why you've had to endure the things you've had to endure. And I've had to endure those that I've had to endure. And He didn't do it because He was angry at you. And He didn't do it because He was resentful towards you. And you're not in trouble. He did it because He loves you. And He wants to show you something about Him that will satisfy you. He wants to do it in a, to bring you to a place where you will know Him and love Him more and trust Him more and marvel at the kind of gracious God that we serve. James chapter 1, verse 2. You guys know this probably by heart. Where he says, Count it pure joy, my brothers, when you endure diverse kinds of trials and temptations. For the trying of your faith produces perseverance. And when perseverance has had its perfect work, it's had its work in you, it will leave you perfect, lacking in nothing. Right? He wants to make you perfect, lacking in nothing. Anybody here want to be lacking in nothing? Yeah? I, I want to be lacking in nothing like three of you want to be lacking in nothing. Everybody else is like, I'm good with lacking. <laughs> That's all good. I'm fine with lacking. I think I'd just be happy to lack a few things. You know, right? Because we're afraid to go, yeah, I'm ready for some trials and temptations. We're thinking, who's volunteering for trials and temptations, right? <laughs> you know, I ain't raising my hand. That guy's crazy. You know, who wants to go and take on 40,000 Philistines? This is crazy. But this is just how good God is. God wants something good for your life. He wants something good in your life. He wants you to know Him in a way that you could never know Him from the couch. <laughs> I want to know Him from the couch. Can't I just know all that stuff from the couch? I want to do like the, the, in, the, in the Matrix, you know? I want to go in and like, go in and have them put me through some little thing that happens really fast and I go, bloop, 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 and now I know Kung Fu or I know how to fly a, uh, now I know how to fly a helicopter or now I know how to do whatever. You know, wouldn't that be great from the couch? It never works that way. It never works that way. Knowing something good costs. It takes time and effort and energy. It's risky. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. You will waste your enemy. You will waste this enemy if you don't believe that God designed it for you. Now look, that doesn't mean that we, get to, that we have to pretend about it. And please, don't ever find yourself being what I call a plastic banana Christian. Okay? You know, you know what they are. You know what a plastic banana Christian is. It's the Christian that... <clears throat> Maybe some of you guys were this way. And, and if, if this happened to you, your spouse didn't come talk to me before the service. Um, but it's the one where, okay, spouse is running late and you guys are trying to get the kids in the car and, and everything's, you know, and, and so you're, you're tense and we're going to be late for church and everything. And on the way, the, and the kids are just yelling at each other and they're spilling the peanut butter and jelly sandwich on their shirt and you didn't get enough coffee and they want to dr- drive through Dutch Brothers and you can't because you're late and you would have had time and you're upset because you didn't get to have time. And so you're starting to get angry with each other. And next thing you know, things are coming out of your mouth at each other that should never be said from a Christian lips and but you did anyways but you're not going to tell anybody that you're driving so fast on the way into church and there's somebody slow in front of you so you zip out and around them and you cut them off and you're jumping in and you pull right into the church and right behind you pulls in the person that you just cut off from church And you're yelling at each other and you're sitting there going and you're on restriction and you're on restriction and you and we'll talk about it. And you get out, and you get out of the car, and there comes the person that you just cut off, and they're getting out of the car, and they go, good morning. (laughs) And you go, good morning, brother. How art thou? (laughs) And they say, blessed, blessed. We're all sitting there going, you phony. You phony. It's like eating a plastic banana. You know, it's like just a mouthful of wax, man, that's no nourishment at all. Looks pretty on the outside, is absolutely worthless, 
okay? Don't be a plastic banana, Christian, okay? It's, it's worthless. Be, be a Christian that's real. You know, and sometimes that's hard because sometimes when you're a Christian that's real and somebody goes, how you doing? And you go, I'm terrible. And they go, good, 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 thank you, God bless you. Because they're not, because they didn't really care and they were just asking the question because they think it's the thing to do. <coughs> Take the time, ask the question. And when somebody says, I'm doing terrible, let's stop. Let's cry with each other now and then, huh? Let's pray for one another every now and then, shall we? Let's be good armor bearers and let's, uh, let's stand with one another. But let's be the kind of Christians that we want to see other kind of Christians be for us, right? It's easy to go, well, that group of Christians, we didn't, what? And, and you go, well, what, what did you do? Well, yeah, but they didn't. <laughs> yeah, you keep bringing it back to them. What are you going to do? Well, but they're jerks and, you know, okay, but can, <laughs> can we stop talking about them for a minute? How are you going to live your life? Can you be the kind of Christian that it, you want every other Christian to be? If everybody else fails, will you be the kind of person that you ought to be? <laughs> you go, <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> no, come on. Yeah, I'm going to be the right kind of Christian. Everybody else might fail, and I can sit there and point my fingers at them, and I'm going to waste time on Facebook for hours <laughs> talking about how bad other people are. Man, wouldn't it be great if we were the kind of people that we just went out of our way to point out good things about each other? You know, to point out the good things in other people, even people that we totally disagree with. Be like, hey man, there's that politician from what other, I know I gotta say this as correctly as I can, politician from what other side I, I am not currently and, <clears throat> and everything, who wore a nice shirt that day. You know, maybe, maybe they didn't vote the way I wanted them to. Maybe they don't think the way I want them to. But, hey, nice car. <laughs> cool, you know, I mean, that they did something right. I don't know. Maybe every now and then they say something right. Do we have to sit there and point down all the flaws of everybody and just keep going with the culture that's just constantly pointing out each other's flaws, sitting around like vultures waiting to pounce to see somebody make a mistake? Man, what if we were the kind of people that weren't like that? And we just go, you know what? I'll tell you what that'll be like. Doing something crazy like that on Facebook will feel almost like standing against 40,000 plus Philistines and saying, you know what? <laughs> Everybody else is doing the, they're not going to war. What if I just go to war today? Come on. They might kill me for it. They might post a bunch of rank stuff about me over it. Who cares? And if your biggest battles happen on Facebook... For crying out loud, you're gonna be a world's not big enough. Okay? Let's stretch it bigger. Let's stretch it to where it's big enough to fit God in it. Okay. So <clears throat> you'll waste your enemy if you choose to isolate from others over it. You will waste your enemy. And by enemy, I mean it could could just be a challenge that's in front of you. But you'll waste your enemy or your challenge if you don't believe that God designed it for you for you. And you know that knowing God is always more valuable than avoiding the worst outcome. Do you know that? Knowing God more, no matter, what the, no matter what the outcome is, knowing God more is better. I might die. Yeah, but you're going to know God more. I might fail. Yeah, but you're going to know God more. I might humiliate myself. Everybody will look at me and think, what a fool. Yeah, but you're going to know God more. Who cares? When we value that more, we'll be more courageous about taking on big enemies, right? So here's the last one. <clears throat> You'll waste your enemy if you look for hope in odds of defeating it rather than hoping in the glory of God in your battle against it. Let me say it again. You'll waste this enemy and this challenge in front of you if you look for your hope in the odds of defeating it. You know, what's your chances of success? You'll waste it. If, that, if that's what you're concerned about, over hope and glorifying God in your battle against it. So, if you're thinking, yeah, but the chances are that that's just not going to work out so good. And I, you know, or if you're going, oh, well, hey, that sounds like a really successful adventure. 
I think I'll jump in that because it sounds like the odds are going to be really successful. Either one of those, you're wasting the enemy. You're wasting, you're wasting this challenge for you. It wasn't, it wasn't there by design so that you could put your hope and your chances against it. It was there by design so you could put your hope in the God who designed it and who would glorify, who, who would glorify Himself in your life through the battle. Guys, our lives are made to glorify God. If that hasn't come across in this message, let me say it again. Your life and mine is designed for this purpose. We are made for one thing, one thing prim primary over all other things. It is to glorify God and to love Him and enjoy Him forever. Amen? This is why we're, this is why we're here. And here's the thing. We are 100% certain. You are 100% certain. I got bad news on the odds. You are 100% certain to face a God-sized enemy or God-sized challenge in your life, within your lifetime. It's going to happen. You, me, every one of us, we are 100% certain there's your odds to face a God-sized challenge in your life. Every one of us. We won't get through life avoiding it. Some of us sit there and go, man, you're telling me. I've had a load of them. I've had a load of them. Some of them go, man, I'm just waiting for them to stop. <laughs> It'd be great for a break. You are 100% certain to, fight, to face a God-sized challenge in your life. But let me tell you something else. Here's the good news. God is 100% certain to meet you in it. It is a 100% certainty that God will meet you in your challenge. Do you know that? It's one that takes a little bit of faith. It's one that takes a little bit of courage. It's frightening looking at the challenge. The challenge looks scary. Facing an army for the glory of God <clears throat> took, took faith and courage that I just think, man, I need, and I'm betting some of you need. <laughs> and there's, there's plenty of them. I know right now, some of you guys are going, man, I don't know, you know, there's a, I got a challenge that I'm facing that just seems impossible, seems like we're going to lose. Maybe, maybe it doesn't turn out the way I want it to. But I am 100% certain of this, that God will be glorified in your life. <clears throat> and if you turn and cling to Him, and look for Him, and listen for Him, and if we gather together as brothers and sisters, and we don't isolate from one another, and we point to and remind each other of a God who's more than capable of taking on 45,000 Philistines, who's more than capable of taking on, who's more than capable of coming in and walking with us, and we feel like our hearts just can't be resuscitated. More than capable of walking with us, and reminding us of His goodness and His kindness, that there's joy on the other side. That's the God we serve. The God that says, you know what, this, it's more, life's not about this life. It's about, a, it's about a King of glory who has created all things and looks to you and to me and says, watch, I'm going to glorify myself in your life, in my life. I'm going to pick this person, this man, this woman, this child. I'm going to pick them and I'm going to make my, my name large among the nations, among Grant's Pass for this reason. <clears throat> Jim Elliott. Some of you guys may be familiar with who Jim Elliott was. Jim Elliott was a missionary who um, he died in 1956 at 29 years of age. He was, he was a missionary in Ecuador uh, to the uh, Warani natives there. And if you've ever watched, um, there's been a couple movies in the last, uh, this, since about 2004, 2002, 2004. There's one called Beyond the Gates of Splendor. There's another one uh, called The End of the Spear. Um, both of them are excellent, and I totally recommend them. <clears throat> they had gone to reach this, this tribe, the Warani, who were a completely unreached people group. 
in Ecuador, and um, as they they had been flying around and offering gifts and, and, and everything, and finally they decided to touch down and, and meet with them in person. And when they did, uh, the Warani came out and killed all four uh, of, the, of the missionaries with spears, ran spears through them, and um, they all died. Um, and that's not the end of the, their story, and, and there has been amazing God-sized miracles that have happened among the Warani people and among the families of, of all of the missionaries that went on that trip. Jim Elliott <clears throat> said this one thing that has inspired many and has always stuck with me. He said, he said, he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You can't keep your life. We're going to give it a, we're going to lose it. You can't keep it. It's <laughs> It's not ours to keep. It's ours to spend. And you're going to spend your life on something. What Jim Elliot knew was that a life spent on the glory of God, on making God's glory known to the nations, telling the world about Jesus Christ. There's nothing better. That's a life worth living. That's a life worth losing. And what he gains, no one can take away from him. No one can take away from him. I don't know what enemies you might be facing this morning and challenges you might be facing this morning. And some of you, huh, and I, some of you I know, some of you I know there's big challenges in front of you. I know this, that the God of all comfort, the God who, who did amazing things with Jonathan, in the nation of Israel is the Jesus that we serve who loves you who will walk with you and wants to do amazing things in your life and mine and so I guess I just ask that you would pray with me and let's, and let's ask the Lord to soften our hearts to think maybe a little bit more like Jonathan to prepare our hearts and minds for maybe God doing something amazing big worth living for and worth dying for in our lives, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for the life of Jonathan and, and for what you did in, in, through, in and through him in the nation of Israel, for this testimony here. And thank you for the enemies and the challenges that you put in our lives, Lord. Huh. And when we're honest, when we're not being plastic banana Christians, but when we're being honest with ourselves, trembling in our bed having a hard time lifting our voices to the ceiling because we're afraid Father would you surround us with brothers and sisters that encourage us would you remind us Lord that none of these things are bigger than you and that you've designed them with purpose and intention in our lives so that we could know you more glorify you more and that you will bring in your kindness, that you will bring peace and joy again in our lives, that you will soften the, the, the weight of these things as we go and we face, as we face them in our lives. Lord, that this will be something that, that makes us perfect, lacking in nothing, complete, Lord. Father, our hope is not in our chances of survival. Our hope is in you. And so, Lord... May we live our lives like people who hope in you. May we share with our friends and love our families like people who hope in you. Lord, I lift the day to you. We lift one another to you. We trust you in all of these things. We pray that you'd go with us and that we'd sense your presence with us throughout the day. Remind us of your goodness. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and challenged to pursue a deeper faith in God through what you've heard. If there's any way that we can help you in your new faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at PursuitNazarene.org and we would love to talk with you. May God bless you this week and hope to see you back again soon. Thanks.